Today we are going to 19th century Canada to cook a dish that has enchanted me for many years. It's a French Canadian recipe called tortière and is very popular, traditionally served for Christmas or New Year's. We'll look specifically at the first Canadian cookbook published in 1840 called La Cuisinière Canadienne. The recipe is basically a big pie cooked in a pot called a tortière filled with ground meat and potatoes. The meat can be pork, beef, but traditionally was game, and it has a lot of spices in it, so it seems very old-fashioned. I first heard about this dish when I was very young. My mother used to set me down in front of the TV, and my favorite show at the time was The Galloping Gourmet with Graham Kerr, who, uh, which was actually filmed in Canada. In one particular episode, he cooked a gargantuan tortière, this historic game pie of Quebec, replete with a variety of meats. And it stuck in my mind, years later, as one of the most incredible things I had ever seen. It became such an obsession that on the day after I got my driver's license, my best friend and I drove all the way from central New Jersey, about 100 miles an hour in a Delta 88 Oldsmobile to Montreal, just so we could taste tortière. And I have no idea why my parents let us go, but we did find the tortière at a place called Les Fils du Roi, which means the Daughters of the King, a historic restaurant, and it actually still exists as far as I know, and the dish is still on the menu. Well, my impression has always been that Quebecois cuisine contains numerous rudiments of 17th century cooking, somehow sort of frozen in time from the point of original settlement, surviving long after they had disappeared back in France. Most notably, there are a lot of spices in savory dishes, but also cooking techniques that are characteristically medieval, frankly. I expect them to find also, as is typical of colonial cuisines, odd substitutions, the use of indigenous ingredients in place of those available in Europe. That is, cuisines always evolve, of course, especially when transplanted. They are the product of their history and they, their interaction with a new environment, people, economic forces. But sometimes they also stop evolving because people want to preserve their traditions. This phenomenon is not unusual among emigrant cuisines. Often a set of classical dishes will become fossilized in a colonial setting and remain as a mark of identity long after the repertoire has changed back in the mother country. And this is partly a function of being cut off, as it were, and retaining antiquated usage. And it happens in language, it happens in dress sometimes. In cuisine, it occurs most frequently among expatriate communities surrounded by other cultures in the majority. If you think of the Portuguese in Macau or Goa, the Dutch in South Africa, or what I think uh, today Indonesia, the Spanish in Mexico and Peru, and I think also the French in Montreal. The publication of a cookbook naturally aids in this ossification of culinary practices because it can become authoritative, a kind of invented authenticity which people thereafter rarely veer away from in their effort to remain true to what they perceive to be the proper way to make a certain dish. And the historical setting is of course crucial to understanding the cookbook because it's written several centuries after settlement. I mean, we're talking Montreal in 1840, which was then the biggest city in Canada, the financial and trade hub, and even the capital for a while. It was also in the thick of the Industrial Revolution. The Lachine Canal had been built, the Victoria Bridge would soon be underway, and one might expect a cookbook would sort of reflect these industrial advances somehow. But in fact, La Cuisinière Cadentienne is decidedly traditional. Most surprising is the recipes in the book call for cooking in a hearth or a wood-burning oven rather than a cast iron stove with hobs on top. Uh, several recipes call for a tripod, or as it's called in English, a spider, uh, on which you set a pot and you cook over hot coals in the hearth. The technology is scarcely different from a century before and recipes could easily have been penned in the 1740s or even in the 1640s. The absence of any prepared condiments and sauces, which is evident in contemporary British cookbooks, is also immediately striking. Everything is made from scratch, and the cookbook's author insists in the introduction that one must start with good fresh butter, the purest flour, and fresh eggs. Implied here is that many people bought stale ingredients in the city, and no doubt the booming population made it increasingly difficult to obtain fresh ingredients from the countryside. It's also important to remember that Lower Canada, which is today Quebec, had been conquered by the English in 1763. So after 77 years, it was still to some extent sort of an occupied territory under foreign rule. And with an influx of English and especially Irish in the 19th century, its cultural identity was considered threatened. 
This was also a time of political reactionism following the failed Republican uprisings of 1837 to 8. The Act of Union of 1840 aimed not only to join Upper and Lower Canada, but to efface the Francophone population and assimilate them among the English as subjects loyal to the Crown. There were even measures to ban French in the legislature. Well, this turmoil would not begin to be settled until later in the decade. So when this cookbook came out, French culture, language, and of course cuisine were definitely under threat. And it's in this context that La Cuisinière Canadienne was written by a group of nuns who remain anonymous in their attempt to rescue French culture. They wrote a cookbook that is not only extremely antiquated, but that includes recipes very much like those of the Middle Ages and Renaissance, recipes that were no longer eaten in France, ironically. In a sense, they invented this tradition, since many generations of French Canadians looked at the book and thought that this was their heritage. There are several tortillas in the book uh, made of veal, potatoes alone, but the ground pork version seems to be the most common. And the, and the recipe is extremely terse. It just says, with fresh pork, the fresh pork is chopped with onion and seasoning, cook in the pan, then fill the dish, which is covered with pastry like pies above. And the seasoning isn't specified, but there is a tortilla after this one for Christmas that's made with tongue and raisins and sugar and cinnamon and mace and cloves. And that's designed to be kept cold for several months and then heated up before service. Now this is exactly the way pies were made in the Middle Ages. Um, but just to show you the similarity, here's a recipe in, from 1604 by Lancelot de Casteau. It's also called a tortier of veal. To make pies of veal with cream, take 12 ounces of veal flesh, cook it, and then have half a pound of beef fat and chop everything together. Beat three raw eggs, four ounces of sugar, half an ounce of cinnamon, a nutmeg, a little salt, a quart of cream, half a quart of cream, everything mixed well together, and make your tart according to your imagination. So I think what the authors of the 1840 cookbook did was reconstruct what they imagined the early 17th century settlers to Quebec would have eaten, and then wrote these recipes, and in turn, everyone reading the book made it their tradition. Okay, so I'm gonna put this tortilla together, and I'm gonna start by um, cooking the meat and the onion. It's really a very, very, cryptic <laughs> recipe. So I think that gives us freedom to do what we like. And I'm gonna follow pretty much a tortilla as it would still be made in Quebec today. And, and it's almost the same as in the um, cookbook itself. Um, she says to use pork. It's more typical to actually use pork and beef. And sometimes, of course, if people have game, they'll put that in or whatever. Um, and I just happen to have had both pork and beef and I think it tastes better that way. Um, the spices that I'm going to use, again, she doesn't say, or I say, should say they don't say, the nuns don't, don't tell us exactly what to use. But typically it's, um, you know, it's cinnamon, um, some mace. I think I've got some coriander will go really nicely with pork. So, uh, but feel free to use whatever you like most. Um, if you want to use a, a straight pumpkin pie spice, that'll be fine. Um, I'm just going to put a little oil in this pan. And stick. And I'm going to start the onions first just because I would like them to be a little more brown. And remember everything's going to cook afterwards also so don't really worry. And for seasoning of course just a little salt. I'd usually use a little thyme also. Okay, let's let that brown for just a few minutes. Okay, I think I'm actually going to do it all in one pan. I was going to do each of them separately, but you know, this is, there's no reason not to just throw it all in one pan. Usually you don't want to crowd the pan if you want to brown something and then serve it, but you know this is going in a pie and it's going to be 
cooked over again, and so I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about that. A little more salt. So if you have ground venison, that would go wonderfully in this. Um, it's also very traditional. I'm going to add our spices. So we have some um, coriander was my choice. <laughs> Cinnamon is absolutely traditional. And some ground mace. I'm going to leave the cloves out of it because I think they tend to dominate everything when you use them. I'm going to add just a little bit of water to this. And if you like, you can add a little bit of flour too. That will keep everything together when it comes out of the pie. I'm going to do that. So I'm going to let this cool off because, of course, we're going to fill our pie with it. We don't want it to melt the bottom crust, and we do want to get it into the oven quickly, but this should be cooled off. Oh, that smells good. Okay. So just let that cool off. And another ingredient, which is um, completely traditional, it's not mentioned in this text, but I think if you were to serve a tortilla to someone in Quebec and not include a potato, they would be very upset. In fact, there are some that are just made of potato. Um, this is just uh, pre-cooked. Of course, we don't want to put a, we, you could put a raw potato in there, but I just want to be absolutely sure that it cooks and kind of brings together all the meat too. So I just, uh, I baked this, which is why the skin is coming off so easily. Okay, so I'm mixing all the potatoes in with the ground pork and beef. And now I'm going to move on to our pie. I rolled out this, uh, the bottom part this early this morning. And I'm just going to put a, make a top for this. Um, I actually used whole wheat. I'm not sure why. I just looked, liked the look of it and I thought the flavor would be very nice. Dust your board nicely. Now for this one, what I'm going to do is since I'm going to, since you can see the dough comes right up to the rim of this and it's not a, um, it's not edged out, it's just a straight side for this pie. I want to make sure that the edge of this is rather thick because I needed to connect to that, to that uh, edge. So I might need to like trim the edge and then f or fold it over to make it slightly thicker on the edge. Okay, so this is the advantage of using a straight edge pie, as I can actually just press in and see where that edge needs to go. I'm just going to lightly score around. I'm not cutting it, I'm just giving myself a guide. And then I know where I roll up that edge, that's where it's got to go. I just make sure it moves. Okay. Well, 
I do believe I eyeballed that rather well. <laughs> so it's, um, you know, two pounds of meat, one potato, one big onion fills this um, size pan, which I'm guessing is about nine inches. Maybe it's eight. Press that down. We want it to be nice and solid. And see, the critical point is where these two connect. Okay. This is going on top. And I'm making sure it connects all the way around. And this is a pie you don't want to have higher than the edge of the thing because there are juices and, you know, it'll just make a big mess. So that's why I'm making a little trough here. And this one, I do believe a fork would be nice. We're just going to decorate it like that. With the edge of a fork. And then give it a little vent hole. If you have one of those little birds that goes in the center, that would be lovely, but it's not a, not like a fruit pie where that's going to go all over the place. Just want a little venting. I think that looks rather good. Okay, putting it in. I would bake that for about an hour until the crispy crust and the meat come together and the potatoes and everything gets hold, held together. So I'll see you in about an hour. I'm feeling extraordinarily audacious today. So um, you could just, uh, this is the, the tortiere that we made. You could just cut a slice out of this and it would be perfectly fine. For some reason, I want to put it on this board. So <laughs> I'm going to try it with my fingers crossed. I'm gonna try and get it out of this. Put the board on top and ta-da! And then let's cut a nice neat slice. And boy, aren't I a happy person today. <laughs> that looks great. <laughs> So for the technique today, we're going to preserve pork belly with maple sugar and then smoke it. Um, that's a kind of bacon, but interestingly in the past, it was not always sliced and fried in thin rashers the way we eat bacon, but cooked perhaps on top of a pot of beans and then cut up and served afterwards. Now, obviously it also flavors the beans, but it becomes quite tender and it's very, very different um, than fried bacon, which is crisp uh, or ideally crisp. To start with, we're gonna take a pork belly that's about 2.5 pounds and season it with liberally with salt, uh, two tablespoons and then maple sugar, which um, looks like this, which is um, it's just dried ma maple syrup, really, but you don't want to use syrup, you want to use the sugar. And then some herbs, I used sage, which is, which is wonderful. And if you like, you can use pink salt or the celery powder to cure it. It's not absolutely necessary, but it gives you that distinctive color and texture. And you're only gonna use half a teaspoon uh, or even less, you can use less than that. So I you basically just wrap this up in plastic, I put it in the fridge and left it there for a week. It was actually there even a little longer, 10 days. In the past, you would have put this in a wooden barrel, stack them up and put it in the, in the cold cellar. Um, and then you will need a smokehouse or a conventional smoker. I prefer something very, very low tech. I have, it's basically just this red metal cylinder with a chamber below and a grill above. And importantly, there's a basin below the grill that catches any drips and prevents the fire from coming in direct contact with the meat. Okay, we're gonna smoke this uh, pork belly and I am lighting a fire with some kindling underneath and just a few small oak logs in this um, old beaten up smoker. I'm going to offer a libation to the gods. It's 
by you. Pow. And I'm going to let this just become a full roaring flame, which will just take a minute. You don't need any big logs because I really just, I'm not, we're not even making a fire. We're just making smoke. Um, this is not really cold smoking. Um, if it were cold, it would probably be under 100, 120 degrees. This is probably going to get up to about 150, but you'll still be able to touch it. It's close, very close to cold smoking. And in fact, what I'm doing is I'm going to put that um, bowl underneath. It'll catch drippings and things and then put the grate and then so the meat will never be in direct contact with, with flame. And in fact, there won't be flame at all. You'll see in just a moment. I'm just going to let those catch. That's probably good enough. Place that carefully in there. Place the grills on top. Here's the pork belly. And I'm going to immediately put this fire out. So that's not hot. And if you watch, the fire's just gone out. The smoke will start and it will eventually get very serious. Um, and you really, to do this properly, you need a big glass of bourbon with some ice and maybe some chewing tobacco and a banjo, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's really uh, lovely just to hang out here, even though it's absurdly hot today. It's over 100 degrees. But this, shall, this will gently smoke, and you'll see it's, it's, it's cool, cool enough to touch, and it won't get much hotter than this. Um, and you could smoke this for one, maybe two hours. It'll, it'll be plenty enough flavor. Uh, you don't want it too smoky. Um, and then this will later go into our dish of fève au lard. Um, and it's also a preservative. Remember, the smoke itself is actually going to preserve. Bacon was not originally, believe it or not, done for flavor. It was done to preserve pork. And this would last um, in some place cool for months and months. This is um, what it looks like. It's actually quite lightly smoked, but very, very fragrant. Um, and so what we're going to do is uh, cook with it right now. Um, I'm going to take three cups of haricot beans. Uh, this is little white navy beans, basically. And I'm going to put them in a pot. So ceramic is ideal. I actually have a um, enamel-lined cast iron pan that I really love for beans. But any, any pot that's covered will work fine. Okay, put that in. I'm going to add a... Um, tablespoon of dried mustard. Tablespoon, just about. Um, I'm going to add a chopped onion. Doesn't need to be too fine or regular. That's, that's perfect. Uh, then a good glug of maple syrup. How much is a glug? You're probably asking me. I have no idea. Let's just put some in. Sweetness. That's probably a half a cup or something like that. Um, and then you put the bacon on top. Now you can put it either in one big piece if you like, or you can cut it up into lardon. I think I'm going to do the latter just so it's evenly spread around so you can see what this looks like. And see that it's still raw. Okay, I'm going to save that for another recipe. And then these will go into little batons, or lardons as they're called actually. Make sure that there's enough room for your beans to swell, because of course they will as they're cooking. And then you're just going to add some water to this.
Add about a tablespoon of salt. And some sage, as much as you like of that. That's about a tablespoon also, maybe a little more. Don't worry about stirring it up. It's all gonna get mixed up as it cooks. Uh, put the top on and you can either leave this on the stove for several hours, which is uh, two to three hours at least, or you can put it in the oven and just let it bake uh, slowly. Um, it seems like a remarkable amount of time to spend on one dish, but the flavor is just phenomenal. And of course you can make it with store-bought slab bacon too. That, that's perfectly fine. But in either case, if you've kept the bacon whole, remove it and then serve, slice it afterwards and serve it with the beans. Um, it's called fève au lard au sirop d'érable, which is sirop d'érable is the uh, maple syrup, beans with bacon and maple syrup. And let me add that if you're not inclined to spend a lot of time making this dish in a historic way, you can make it very quickly in an, um, a multi-purpose cooker with navy beans, store-bought bacon, and maple syrup. And you literally press the button on there and it goes beans and that's it. You know, it's, it's, the flavor is still very good. I don't want you to be, you know, dis, dis, um, discouraged because you think, oh, I don't have a smoker and I'm not doing all this. You can make the, the dish anyway. Um, so I hope if you ever go to Montreal, do uh, try to get a tortier and definitely try to get what they call in French beans, <laughs> which just means beans. They don't always say fev, they also say beans in French. Enjoy.